Thanks, Jeff. Um, next, we'll have uh, our teammate, your uh, presentation uh, for Steve Levine today. We have uh, Manuel Pandeca presenting. Right. You look like he's out of town, so step. So, uh, Manuel, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so the focus here is on two upgrades, version 2.5 and 2.6. Uh, ongoing upgrades and uh, general information. So we're trying to upgrade every six months, roughly. The tentative plan here, we're targeting uh, quarter one and quarter three of uh, FY17. And as always, the Parallel data will be made available through the EMC FTP server and the National Brand Viewer website. Uh, we uh, have monthly telecons, keep a list server, and a VLAP page, and the coordination with the field is done through uh, the group of source. Uh, suggestions for, uh, for improvement usually come from that group and from the field. Uh, but the requirements are currently being driven by the National Blend and the FAA. So one challenge that should perhaps be mentioned is that uh, the parallels are usually only available a few weeks before code must be handed off. This, this has to be with a tight schedule that we have. We're upgrading every six months. So usually, so development must begin on the next system almost immediately after code handoff, so before the implementation. You don't take a rest between implementations. You don't that, that take implications. <laughs> so we're not continuous. It is. We're not complaining, but, but I, I just, just thought that we could make uh, everybody aware of, yeah, of the challenge. Yeah, especially six-month cadence. That's by far the most aggressive yeah. uh, right. system we have. And, and the other issue, of course, is the delay that we for, for instance, right now, the, the upgrade that will take place in August is tied, uh, it's, is merged with her and the RAP upgrade. So, and with the issues that we had with the, her and RAP, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't been able to set up the next part. Oh, so. okay. So, so the version 2.5, Q1 of FY17, that's not. That, that's not. So what's the, going in in August? Two point four. Two. Uh, I, I think that that was presented in. I, I know, but but okay. the point is. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that we're going to have an upgrade in August right. when the wrap her goes in. That's correct. Then we're going to have another upgrade in Q1 of 17. Right. And then there's going to be another upgrade in Q3, Q3 of 17. Of 17. Right. right. So that's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. Uh, we do not have any sample fields right now or results for much of what is presented here. Uh, we're still working on the code, uh, but we hope to have the parallels for the 2.5 version available soon after the August implementation. So results, including cross-validation stats, will be presented at the CCB. Okay, now going into details, what are we doing? What, what, is, the, what is the scope of the 2.5 uh, upgrade? Uh, a major change is the implementation of a 15-minute uh, RTMA system. This is a request from the FAA AWC to support the HAMS program. Uh, this would imply a significant increase in the resources, so about a 75% increase in disk and tape space. And, and I know that Jeff DeMago was <coughs> to HPC RAC to get a uh, <coughs> Uh, but there is significant core. So, so is it that one program that is driving this 15-minute requirement, or are there other programs and applications that require this 15-minute? It's it's all of the hams that is driving this. So is this something that should go through uh, things like cards and uh, the MDC? Well, this is we haven't fully baked the, the entire governance, but yeah, I understand that. Big. Let me, yeah, yeah, this this is Bob. I know, this is coming out of the STI uh, requirement for CNV. In other words, uh, I believe EMC is being compensated in some way for for this. Maybe not directly for the modeling uh, processing increase, but uh, we do have personnel assigned to this project from EMC. Okay, I'm just 
Well, we're not we're not talking about the 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 fact that we're working uh, on the products. We're talking about this uh, updating to changing to 15 minutes. It's more of com yeah. computing and so implication and so on. So forth. one is that um, going to 15 minutes itself. Um, I take it as a requirement from F from FAA. What uh, you may need uh, the 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 governance may want it to be vetted through the through the cards process. But but let me just take it that yeah, as, as a valid requirement. Yeah. On the, at, at the same time, right. by doing so, that uh, seventy five percent increase in the in the resource that, that itself may also probably also need to go through some governance process on prioritization. Yeah, that would be a resource. And again, you know, this is not a big computationally demanding system. Right, that's what I wanted to mention. Work storage, and um, and again, I don't know the scope of. We'll, we'll get into the details, but okay. You know, it, it's always interesting the requirements process. So, so Bob, you know, I take I take it it is a requirement. This is Jeff uh, from Central Region. I I do think that. This is more than just a helicopter requirement. This is something that is tied into situational awareness uh, on the national Sioux team dealing with that. It's tied into digital aviation services in general. Uh, we, we really have to have more frequent fields of ceiling and visibility than hourly in, uh, in order to transfer the TAF program into a one that's driven with digital aviation services. And even 15 minutes is arguably not enough, but I, I, I wouldn't want to think that there's only one person, one little helicopter group driving the requirements for this. That's exactly my point. So I'm glad to hear that you're thinking in terms of other other programs like DAS, for example, that requires this, and and that's why I asked the question. So right. Right. Okay. Hypothetically, if you do go through a card process, this is what you expect. You hope coming out of that and then be validated by the MDC. All right. And yeah, this, this is Andy. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit dismayed too. You know, we got a Sioux team looking at the quality of the RTMA, and and then we have a sub team looking at trying to address the question what is good enough and there's been a lot of a lot of really good back and forth activity going on but you know a, a major bullet that's missing from this is you know the RTMA is still struggling to be a good enough analysis and you know I'm, I'm a little dismayed that that's not on this slide I mean that ought to be a focus to get this darn thing ready for the for what we're trying to do with the blended models and everything else uh, and there's actually a slide on uh, how good is good, so I'll talk about that at the very end. Okay, and uh, okay, uh, we're also adding a, a UNV as control variables to diagnose wind direction, and with that in place, the wind analysis will be pretty much similar to what John Horrell is doing at the University of Utah. So basically, we're moving away from the GSI standard of using stream function and velocity potential to analyze UNV. Uh, so we'll be changing the ceiling and hours from experimental to non-experimental. So the ceiling and hours will be implemented in August for the first time, but we consider it to be an experimental product just because we have not uh, done enough evaluation. So there will be some improvement there, in, including improving the first guess by adding the AR per component. Uh, we'll start moving the QC, the Mesonet the QC processing from the GSI to SBM edit. This will allow for near real time updates and will remove the SPA team from the process. Uh, this was requested by the uh, WFOs, NWS regions, and also by NCO SPAS. Uh, we're expanding the Kona's domain westward. This was requested by OPC and Western Region. We're adding new observations, so Mesonet from Urbanet. Uh, we're adding uh, Mesonet visibility observations. Currently, uh, visibility is only using meters. 
and we're adding satellite wind, other types of satellite wind. We're also uh, improving the uh, wind analysis over the Great Lakes by adapting uh, a Guller type analysis. And uh, there will also be enhancements to the precip. We're adding Irma precip for Alaska, Puerto Rico, and we're also adding a 24-hour precip in addition to the current six-hour. Okay, so this is uh, Ying. You like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, precip uh, RTMA uh, right now is operational. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Right now, the operational precip RTMA is corners only mosaic from the input QPE from the 12 river forecast centers uh, over corners. And we, for the upcoming implementation, uh, that's for the uh, first quarter of 2017, we plan to add uh, Puerto Rico uh, and Alaska to this suite. We have already acquired the Puerto Rico QPE uh, through the official channel, and Alaska is working with NCO to get the Alaska data through the telecommunications network. Telecommunications gateway. Okay. Uh, another thing is that right now the precip uh, Irma is six hours only. Um, we are planning to add a 24-hour mosaic uh, using the 24-hour QPEs from those RFCs that produce uh, 24 hours as their primary uh, the base analysis. The reason for this is that uh, the Arch, uh, IRMA being a mosaic from the uh, 12 corners RFCs, and each RFC, when they produce their analysis, they use the algorithm and method that's best suited for their own domain and weather and climatology. So when users look at the Conus mosaic, it's not always seamless. Sometimes they will see an inconsistency across the uh, RFC boundary. Uh, this example is for the northern uh, Colorado. And if you look at the left panel, uh, you could clearly see a seam uh, between the uh, the Missouri Basin RFC and the Colorado Basin RFC. And on the right is a 24-hour uh, mosaic using uh, the 24-hour QPEs from some Western RFCs. And you see in this case, there's much better continuity across the boundary. Uh, this does not address the issue of uh, inconsistency in the six-hour mosaic itself, but at least these will provide additional product for the uh, users uh, where the, the consistency is better. Okay, thanks. Okay, this is the new domain, so basically we're adding the, the yeah, green uh, portion. Well? Yes? Hi, uh, this is a Brian Moreski from Eastern Region. Just to a quick thing, this, the, uh, on Ying's slide, this goes back to requirements again. Uh, you know, Eastern Region wants to think about this a little further, you know, that we're not convinced that this is the right solution. We're not convinced that the requirement has been validated and this is the right solution. Uh, there's some issues with uh, what the RFCs are doing in terms of their QPE. And so, you know, we haven't had a, a, a chance to really think about this in detail yet, but this, again, goes back to the questions that were brought up earlier in terms of requirements and validating the requirements before deciding on a solution. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, this is a proposed change, and we'll await uh, uh, the outcome. Uh, but, but there is a requirement for the QPF, correct? For the QPE, yes. Yeah. QPE. Yeah, and Ying is already doing uh, something for that. She's proposing a, a change to possibly adding something else here. Hey, you know, this is Andy. Um, can you give me a little bit of background on how we ended up here? Because this, this surprises me a little bit, too. 
uh, the background on why we are doing the 24-hour uh, QPE? From the RFCs, I mean, um, the RFCs have been doing a pretty decent job at this over the years, but I thought the long-term goal was to move, move more towards an automated process. Um, well, I don't think it could ever be fully uh, automated. Uh, there's always a lot of value in the human input, uh, especially for the real-time analysis or near real-time analysis. And I think the local expertise always has uh, a lot of value. So what I'll say, and then we'll move on, is that you know, the, the issue of QPF, QPE, having multiple products and things like that is something we got to get our heads around corporately, especially with the water center coming online. So, you know, I hear what you guys are saying, and I think this is something that we need to address from a requirements perspective and then look at, look at what's available and come up with alternative solutions to it. I'm just looking at yeah. things. Yeah, let me be careful here. Um, you know, they... The RCs, I think, at least I can just speak for the Western RCs, try to do a pretty decent job, but I'm not aware that that's part of, you know, that this solution is part of the long-term vision of where we're going. And I'm a little bit confused on, you know, allegedly the MRMS is supposed to be picking up the slack and getting better and better and better, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure where, where that's all going, so... So anyway, I, I you know I, I want to make this not entirely negative. I mean, I appreciate they're trying to do something different, but I'm not sure this is. I agree with Eastern Region. I'm not sure this is the right strategic long-term goal. Can I give Can I give some context from my perspective? Is uh, we were initially cobbling together. You know, the best ground truth that we have right now that, that's available is RFC QPE, and uh, some of the SUs, particularly in Colorado, had given some input that when we put together the six hourly IRMAs in a 24 hour fashion, you got some of these discontinuities across, you know, like, like on the left hand side. And so they tried to come up with a solution so that the 24-hour QPE using RFC QPE is, uh, is a more seamless product. Now, the issues of what we might transition to in IRMA, I think, are valid concerns. However, they've come up with a, what I think is a pretty nice solution to address what we have now in Irma, but I, I don't know that anyone's arguing for, at least in my impression, arguing for this as a final solution. It just produces better quality in the current Irma for these 24-hour mosaics that we use for a lot of things, including follow-up IDSS after heavy rain. So I, I appreciate some of the concerns, but there was input from Colorado, and I, I think they've need, done a nice job, but, it, I mean, is, it, is this a final solution and then we're done? Because if it is, yeah, I, I agree with what Eastern and Western has said, but if this is just a step towards using something better, then, then, then I think we're on the right track. So I just want to make a very quick comment that uh, uh, this is, a, is, in my perspective, we've got to be careful about the term requirements, okay? When I say requirements, I think about service requirements, and service requirements are already well established. I think uh, we were talking about technical requirements, so this is in the solution space, and so we need to get regions, EMC all together, stakeholders all together, look at what is the, uh, the, the best approach toward a solution as, as opposed to uh, uh, you know, um, not a, well, you know, lack of coordination per se, uh, and so I, that's that's I, I want to come. This is not a service requirement I issue. Therefore, there should have nothing to do with cards. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add something. Um, 
That's a, that's a good point. I think the, really the long-term solution is for RFC to improve uh, the consistency across uh, the, the boundaries. And I think they are working hard on this. And now RFCs are paying more attention to labor. Um, yep. And as, as uh, as more RFCs start to use uh, MRMS, and uh, there will be better continuity across the boundaries. Uh, this is a sort of uh, the 24-hour mosaic is just a way to take advantage of what's available out now that we could have a product that's slightly better. Yeah, and I appreciate what Andy was saying about incrementally going to where you want to go, but. There's a little bit of a perpendicularity to what, what's going on in the weather service here, too, because on the one side, we're trying to use things like lens and like completely objective methods to make sure that we unify the products from the different areas, river centers and everything else. And if you put that back into your analysis, then you do exactly the opposite. So you have to be a little careful where you're going, because you actually start to include in your, in your products uh, some of these discontinuities and there's those artificial edges again, but anyhow. Well, it goes to the, uh, the last thing I'll say on this matter is what's the long-term vision for weather service with QPE and QPF? Yeah. Right? We've been dancing around that forever yeah. as well. If I could just make one comment. I was speaking with Mary Molusky about two weeks ago. There's a proposal that is about to go into CARS that is all about <coughs> improving stage four QPE. So I think a good action from this is to have the RTMA folks tag up with with her to make sure that their vision and what they're planning fold into the Is that vision for our team? That vision shared with the SSDs? I don't believe it has been. Hey, hey Dave, that, that's, that's interesting news, and yeah, that's uh, brand new news to me. Okay, I don't want to talk about the governance process right now, but... Um, <laughs> Sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> let's move on, Thank but you. it's been noted. Okay, so this is the new domain we just had in the, the green park there to support the OPC Western region. Uh, this is an example of uh, Mesonet uh, from uh, Urbanet. We're already getting the OPS in the DEF tanks, but we haven't performed any impact evaluation yet. Uh, this is another example that shows the new uh, Mesonet visibility observations. Uh, those are the, the, the ones in the red. Uh, just like with the Urbanet Ops, you're getting them in the DEF tank, but you're still to perform uh, to see the back on in, uh, analysis. Uh, Google, Google Enhancement Ops. So the WaveWatch group wants to initialize Great Lakes model of RTMA, but the wind field is not smooth enough. So they would like to use a field which is close to what the Google is producing. Uh, the solution here is to use the same pseudo orbs as those used by Google in generation of the uh, to generate the RTMA analysis. So their formula was developed to derive overlay conditions for nearby land surface orbs from uh, nearby land surface orbs. So the new pseudo orbs are placed over the lake, but the original remains at its original point. And we are performing separate analysis for land and water and combine them together into the final analysis. So technically, this is done just by using two control variables, one for land and the other for water. So you're not really running two separate analysis. Uh, the Great Lakes Coastal uh, WFOs have also expressed interest in this enhancement. I thought the uh, argument was the other way around. It was too smooth and that you really have to get the land sea transition right. That was the argument, right? No, well, the, the problem with the Great Lakes is that we have very few data. They're like a single buoy. Yeah. So what we would get are these bullets, the bullet kind oh, of Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But sure. the near shore was an issue too, though. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is an example of, of the Guller analysis and the Irma analysis. You have to see that there are differences there. And hopefully, with uh, the new enhancements, the analysis will be much closer. Uh, op selection quality control issues. So, N-Saplin and W4s often don't see the same ops. 
uh, WFOs often want exact match to meter size, this, uh, which is the way match ops all works. Uh, some of the WFO questions that we get and uh, some of the MCO responses. So this is uh, Steve Levine's style. Why isn't target by drawing for my favorite orb? The answer would be because uh, there are many orbs. There, there are many other orbs around here. Uh, what do you mean it isn't your favorite orb too? Well, we usually use all the orbs that are available, right? Uh, you're using data from where, who? Uh, those are terrible. So we get that kind of feedback. Well, well, thanks for telling us. <laughs> we work on getting those, uh, removing those orbs from the, the anomalies. Okay, so the, the next point I think that is very important. You're trying to move the reject list from GSI file to SDM edit. And this will, will allow for near real time editing without involving system change. So right now, when, there, when we need to make a, a, a change to the reject list, we need to submit an RFP. And that can take for long, for forever to be implemented. Uh, so we get questions like, why haven't you thrown out this op yet? We told you about it two weeks ago. But I mean, it takes a lot, a lot longer than that to get the, the, the change through the RFC. Uh, and then we get uh, uh, feedback from the spas. Uh, do the words frozen system mean anything to you people? <laughs> like in, in, in the last update, I mean, we kept changing the project list several times. We get <laughs> feedback from the field and send an email. And so, uh, so the SDM edit process, uh, which is already successful to treat the meter uh, orbs, will be very useful for the RTMA. And, and not just for the RTMA, because the reject list from the RTMA is also used by the NAM. So this will help, help the NAM as well. Can I, I, I'm really sorry. I, 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 wanna, I wanna be respectful here. Um, but if I showed that slide to the field, they would be deeply offended by, does the words frozen system mean anything to you? And, he, and here's why, again, I, I'm, and I'm just trying, I think everybody needs to understand the culture here. Uh, people do a lot of really impressive quality control at the local level, and they do it in a fairly agile and nimble manner. And, you know, there are a lot of concerns about the quality of the RTMA and the IRMA, and, people in the, lo in the local field are used to doing things on the order of minutes and days, and they've been told that local innovation and things like that are, you know, in, in some ways hard to manage, and then that we need to do things nationally. But if it takes months and years to do things, you have to understand that that, that is something that they have a little bit of trouble grasping. and. So I would be careful, you know, in a meeting like this, I could see making statements like that, but they take a lot of pride in this quality, and, and, we ha and I hear a lot of laughter in the background, but we really want the field to buy into this, and we have to be very careful about that kind of behavior. And I just, I just I'm speaking for 38 offices here and people that are, are trying to help make this work. Yeah, this is Jeff. this is Andy. I I want to echo well that. Thank you, Jeff. I want to I want to echo what what Jeff said, and also, you know, this issue about what is good enough. Um, again, you know, we formed a, a sub of the RTMA suit team. We formed a sub team uh, with Dave Bernhard leading it because we 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 are going to have to come to grips with. Using good science, how do we decide when somebody complains? Well, that's within the range of science because people sort of forget ASOS has its errors too. I mean, you know, from a mechanical point of view, it's plus or minus, uh, I forget the statistics, uh, one and a half degrees uh, within a certain range, and I think up, upwards of a little over two at a, at a much broader range. So, and then you also have the issues of represent, 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 being representative of, of the area. So we've asked a SOOD team to, using some good science and being thoughtful, come up with some guidance on, on how to do this. 
But I guess the other part that I sort of object to, I shared with you some of the some of the emails that Tim Barker did, and I got I got to give a lot of thanks to Steve Levine. He he just openly shared some files, and and even with ASOS, we have some fundamental problems here. Uh, you know, and, and there's some easy ones like. You know, the OBS aren't, you know, don't have the right lat long locations, but when you start looking at some of the graphics that we generated, uh, Chuck Healer from, from, uh, from Stephen and, and, and Tim's work, um, the R2MA is still fundamentally not working probably the way it ought to be working, and I'm a little dismayed that that's not showing up on the side here. So, yeah, I hear laughter, but God damn it, this is a serious issue, and we've got to get these things fixed. And, and, you know, if this is going to become as important as we all want it to be. And I know I just used a cuss word, but this is getting really frustrating, and I'm, I'm a little bothered by some of the attitude that I'm hearing here. I mean, and, and also, you know, this, this thing about we've got to quit jumping around. In Western Region, we, we were doing match odds. We also had a, an approach where we could be editing the odds. And things like regional OBS and being able to change station lists, we tried that, and what ends up happening is you just permanently get rid of stuff. And there was so it, it's not the panacea. Having humans do manually manual editing of stations is not necessarily the panacea that everybody thinks it is. It's good for getting rid of sites that are just blatantly bad, but in terms of sites that come and go, it's it's not a good approach. So we got to get our arms around this. There's a couple different problems. We got to get our arms about how we're going to do it, and we got to get the RTMA actually operating better. It's still not reflecting, you know, you have the first guess field, but it should be, this is an analysis, not a, you know, an analysis of, of what the state of the atmosphere is not used as input to a model, so it really ought to be reflecting the odds a little bit more than what it is, and that's been a pretty touchy point with the field up to now, and I respect that. I think they're right. Yeah, so uh, just one last comment. I mean, I've taken a lot of heat from the, the central region field for making the switch to Irma in its current state. Uh, and I just, you know, when, when, when I, you know, I see this in the slide, I mean, just please don't, I just would hate to see this stuff get out to the field because they would be beyond pissed. And so I, I just, I, I just want you all to be aware. Okay, so this is this is Bill. I fully appreciate your perspective, and when I saw the, ask, the exclamation points and question marks, we're going to delete the slide right now. Um, and uh, you know, I don't care what the intent was. The the and maybe these are real comments. I don't really care. Um, and your point about priorities <laughs> is what I'm taking away here because we have been dealing with this for a while. Um, I do give the RTMA group a lot of credit for being more responsive to the field than they had been in the past. And what I'm hearing is that, you know, we got some upgrades coming and perhaps we're not really focusing on the, the top priority. And that could be a problem. So what I'm asking EMC to do is to really consider what the top priorities are for the upgrades and try to perhaps put more emphasis there and then maybe some less emphasis in some of the other lower priority areas. All right. So with that being said, What's the whole point? So what's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is that we need to do a lot more on quality control. Okay, so that was the purpose here? Right. We know that. And, and what are we doing? So we're, we're, moving, we're move, moving the reject list from the GSI to SDM added. That's the main message. Okay, and how is that going to help us? Because that will allow for near real-time change of the reject list. Okay, and who has the, who has the authority to do the near real-time changes in the list? If we, we get feedback from the field, we go upstairs to the SDM person and we request that the observation be placed. On so is that every hour? Is that every second? That can be ever done every day, basically. And so has that workload then been communicated to the spa, because, uh, the SDM, because now you're putting an additional workload on the SDM, but you could have the field calling that person perhaps 50 times an hour. No, that... that no, that will, that will be done through the RTMA group. I mean, we'll get the information and we'll contact All right. Them. Just my advice to you is to make sure you think it out clearly. Right. So that you don't create a process we can't handle in the end. Right. All right. And I'm sure you're working with the field and working with, yes. the, with 
the SDM to make sure we don't do that. Yeah, so this is work in progress, but that's the main aim. Sure, what's and the th that's excuse me, because something happens on a late Friday night or something like that. That's if what I mean. We're the ones, you know, it, it doesn't become an operational. Well, that's why, I, that's why I'm asking, yeah. because you, you yeah. may create a process we can't support. Right? Right. Or so we'd have to figure out how we just support it. Yeah, but the, the, idea is, the, idea is, the idea is that you move away <laughs> from something that allows you only to change these things every six months. I get that. To, That's and, and, and this is, we, we have, it's not like it's completely new either. When we were looking at the uh, Sandy aircraft data, uh, some, some of the, uh, when we brought the new data in, some of that included uh, uh, Steve going upstairs, I thought it was Steve going upstairs to work with the SDM on uh, literally doing these uh, SDM edit uh, approach to get the new quality control in. I got the concept. I understand more flexibility. That's great. Field interaction. That's good. But right. just go into it with your eyes wide open, so we don't make promises we can't keep. Yeah, sure. Yeah. This side. Go so ahead. this is working already for the meters, but of course for the mesonet it would imply a lot more work because quality control should be so. All right. Should be a lot more stricter. Okay, uh, there's already work going on on trying to, uh, or maybe I should go back there. So another one potential solution would be the use of the Curve QC, which is being developed at Natis. I'm not really aware of how it works. Uh, Steve Levine was the person to talk about this. But hopefully this will also help with the quality control. Uh, this is, this is just an example of temperature observations for giving an out time. Green are the observations that I use. The yellow are the ones that are uh, held for cross-validation, and the red ones are the ones that are rejected. And this is just to show the work that is going on to try to improve quality control. So KML files are being generated at the EMC. They show the location and other information regarding the ops, and they're displayed on the MDL viewer. Uh, and example files were recently sent to the field for evaluation. So basically as a way to, to, to help this process of quality control. And uh, realize that the platforms often don't see uh, all the ops that you're using in the RTMA. So we need to work on that. It has to be coordination. Uh, plans for uh, V2 uh, version 2.6. Uh, so adding a means 11 hours requirement by, required by MDL and the national ban, extending cloud co cover and filling an hours to the autonomous domains required by FAA, adding a mean max of RH analysis, this is also a request by MDL and National Band. Uh, adding Irma for Guam and American Samoa. Uh, this is a requirement by MDL, National Band. So we'll need to create a new system for American Samoa. We already have one for Guam. Uh, we'll be increasing the resolution of Puerto Rico domain from 2.5 to 1.25, which is the current NDFD resolution for Puerto Rico. Uh, we'll be implementing the, the consensus terrain and land sea mask for Okanas. Uh, this is a requirement from the MDL National Blend. Uh, this has been done for Okanas already. Uh, we'll be adding data point data for airports, <coughs> for dew point, wind, pressure, ceiling, and visibility as requested by FAA. Currently, we're providing temperature data. Uh, Upgrading statistic background error and we're adding an ensemble component to the RTMA system. Uh, how good is good enough? Uh, so forecasters often want or would like to see a match to the local meter, but uh, because of the, the way the RTMA or house works, that cannot happen, right? Uh, so there is a working group now, a SUS working group, that uh, is working to define how close enough is an acceptable match. Uh, factors to include would be the analysis uncertainty, observation instrument error, op selection, etc. Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, the analysis uncertainty cur currently gets the pattern right, but the magnitude is, is uh, 
obviously incorrect. Uh, version 2.6 upgrade will hopefully address this issue. Uh, and I think that Andy has mentioned that increments were sent to, uh, oh no, that, that was different. So we'll be sending increment plots or displaying increment plots via the MDL viewer uh, to help assess the quality of the analysis. I think that that's it. Back up. Any final questions in the room on the phone? Um, what's the plan for the wave heights to be added to? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, th that should be 2.6. Uh, right to add that. So that would be Q3 of FY17. But th that will depend on you because uh, that the, the part that you are supposed to do is red, which is to have the, the capability to analyze wave height in the GSI. So, but I know that your group is still working on the background there and all the right. So do you solicit priorities from every, from all the stakeholders? Like, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So you get a whole list of, up, of things to work on. Right. We, are they prioritized, given your limited staff and and where we're going? Uh, yeah. I mean, so far we haven't had any issues with uh, meeting the requirement in terms of all development. Something that we staff in that sense. <coughs> uh, but the requirements usually come in from the monthly meetings that we have and the list server. So there is really a close collaboration with the field and uh, right now with MDL. All right. This, this is Andy. Um, I'm going to probably weigh in where I shouldn't, but you know, there's been some really good changes, and I don't want to be just all negative. There's been some really good changes. You know, Steve Levine, I know, on the, uh, like on these two teams, um, this is the one of some of the teams. Ming has asked the SFD chiefs to sort of, you know, get these things going and sort of keep tabs on them. And, you know, Steve Levine is very open and honest, and that's good. You know, having that honest dialogue between the R2 developers and, and the SUS, I think, is, is, is great. That's how you resolve things. Like I said, the, the, the good enough team, Steve shared that stuff, and it was like, wow. You know, there's, there's some things that need to be fixed. In terms of resources, uh, with all due respect, and well, I'm going to disagree a little bit, this is a really important project, and I don't think we're making it, – it's so, it's so key to so many other things, like the National Blend of Models, both for – bias correction and for verification uh, and, and all sorts of other things that, that are part of where we're trying to go into the future. No, I, I, don't, I don't think there are enough resources. We've we got to be moving faster to make this better. And, and it's not anywhere I'm, you know, there's, you know, for whatever reason, the West keeps getting blown off a lot of things. But I'll only speak for the West, but there's still some pretty significant issues that need to be fixed. We know they can be fixed because, you know, of the work of people like John Harrell, who over the years did some prototyping efforts. But I, I know, I'm, I'm respectfully, I, I think we could use some more help in this area. We need to be more responsive. And I mean, that, and I'm offering this with all due respect. I'm not taking a shot at anybody. No, that's why I asked the question. Um, so well, I mean, we I mean we can we can give you a quick example. I mean, it, it hit 100 degrees in Salt Lake recently, and we've seen that there's a consistent four to eight degree cool bias at that grid point at the airport. And we, if we are willing to accept that, that's fine. But it's it's really it's going to be very confusing to customers if this is really the analysis of record and. I just those are the kind of issues. I understand analyses aren't perfect and won't match, but we I don't know how to message that to forecasters and customers right now. 